But how about you all? Did you come prepared as people have come in? If they have, has anyone come prepared with their um, uh, favorite problem they would rather have answered? Well, really, I would like to see a wor uh, word problem solved just because word problems always um, are confusing okay. to me. <laughs> OK, how about the wire problem? Sounds great. OK. A wire. I'll read it and then make it bigger again. A wire is stretched from the ground to the top of an antenna tower. The wire is 35 feet long. The height of the tower is seven feet greater than the distance D from the tower's base to the end of the wire. Find the distance D and the height of the tower. Oh my. Okay. This is what it's saying. You should always try to make a picture. We can make it red. <laughs> Let's have a wire. Only it's going to be more vertical than that. Because the tower is higher than it is far away from the from the tower. So yeah, it's going to be more like that. I don't know. Anyway, so you've got grass growing up, right? You've got a tower. And you've got grass. Um, this distance right here is D. Uh, D. The distance D from the tower's base to the end of the wire. Meanwhile, this is H. So we have D and H, and this is 35 feet. So since this is a right triangle, we assume, um, in order to find H and D, we're going to use the, the uh, quadratic formula. But first, we have to write what we're also told and that is that the tower is seven feet, the, the length of the tower is seven feet greater than the distance. So H equals D plus seven. And the formula we're going to use is A squared plus B squared equals C squared and with that well let me write this all right so d plus seven squared plus d squared equals 35 squared because the slanted side is always d now that's the hard part really once you've got it set up, it just becomes a math problem to solve. But until then, you have to be trying to think about what is, what are all those words really saying? And to me, it always helped if I could draw a picture. And this next problem is the same thing, only instead of a wire that's slanted, you're going to have an extension ladder but you're still going to be dealing with a, with a, uh, a right triangle and a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So let's do this. And I'm just going to take this and put that over on the scratch paper because we are going to need more room, I think. No, this, okay. All 
All right, so now, please do not be fooled by that. D plus seven squared does not equal D squared plus 49. It does equal D plus seven times D plus seven. That's what that equals. And then there's a plus D squared. Equals whatever 35 squared is. 35 squared, ugh, 1, 2, 2, 5. 1, 2, 2, 5. Let me make sure. Okay. So we're going to have D squared plus 7D plus 7D plus 49 plus D squared equals 1,225, but don't use a comma. Can get you messed up. Okay, D squared plus D squared is 2D squared, and 7D plus 7D is 14D plus 49, equals 1225, and I have to set it equal to zero to solve. So minus one, two, two, five, minus one, two, two, five, and that will give us zero, and two D squared plus 14, D plus that, oh, that's going to be a minus, isn't it? Because the bigger number is minus. But anyway, the calculator will take care of that. We're going to say 49 minus 1, 2, 2, 5. Enter. Negative 1176. Okay, now, two will go into each of these numbers because, of course I know two goes into 14, but the fact that this number ends in a six and I know that two goes into six, well, that means two will go into the entire number. So that's the only one I don't know. So let me take 11, negative 1176 and divide it by two and see what I get. Okay, that's going to be negative 588. So I'll pull out a 2 GCF. Double check. Yes, 588 minus. OK, then only because it's an equation, C equals zero. Equals comes from the word equation. Divide by two and divide by two. So we're going to have D squared plus 7D minus 588 equals zero. Now we have to factor this. Okay, there is a one in front of the D squared. I'm assuming that this is factorable. We're gonna use that little calculator trick again. This time it'll be negative 588. 
Negative 588 divided by X. And then come down to Y2, say X plus negative 588 divided by X. And then not enter, it's so easy to hit enter. Uh, nothing bad will happen if you do. Nothing will happen. See? Oh, the cursor will go down. What a wonderful opportunity. Well, I'll leave it there because that's where it came up. No, got to make it bigger. There. Okay. Now, second graph, and there we are. What do I need? I need a positive seven, and it's right there. This must be Christmas, right? Look at that, positive seven. That's what we need. We need two numbers that add up to positive seven. I look for positive seven in Y2, and there it is right there. Incredible. Sometimes you have to search for it for a while. But like I said, I have a theory that today must be Christmas. Jingle bells, jingle bells. No, that might bring snow. No more snow. Okay. Now I'm going to circle that. Okay. There it is. Right here. Negative 21 plus 28 equals 7. 7 is the middle number. Yeah. Try doing that with the mouse. Why? There now. Okay. All right, so C7. Seven. seven. Cool. So now I take, I take D and I take D and I take minus 21 and plus 28. And then I set each factor equal to zero. D minus 21 equals zero. D plus 28 equals zero. And then I add 21 to both sides, so I get D equals 21. I subtract 28 from both sides, I get D equals negative 28. And then I stop and think, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the distance from the end of the wire to the tower. You know, there's grass growing and stuff. So that doesn't make any sense to make it negative 28. 
So, boom, boom. That means D is going to equal 21, and D plus 7, which is the height, that's going to be positive 28. So let me put, and most of the time, it works out like that, but I have a vague memory of being a student and, and just assuming it would work out, and it didn't. So don't just assume that that's the other answer. Make sure. Except it'll be positive, of course. All right, so 21 and 28 are, are, are our answers. So let's go back. The distance, this distance is going to be 21 feet. And then this is seven feet longer than that distance. So this is going to be 28, which makes sense. Towers should be 28, not 21. Okay. Now, this problem is like that problem. Let's do this problem. You went up to 640 feet above the ground and you threw a ball. Only this is not distance, this is measuring the time it takes for the ball to hit the ground. So this says a ball is thrown upward with an initial velocity of 96 feet per second from a height of 640 feet its height h in feet after t seconds is given by this formula right here. And they want to know how long does it take for the ball to hit the ground? We're going to have to go to the scratch paper for this. This is not hard if you stop and think. Not hard at all if you stop and think. This is how high it is after a certain amount of time. T is time. So what we're trying to find is, okay, how high is the ball? Or how long does it take for the ball to hit the ground? But there is another question here. And that is the height of the ball above the ground. And it's important, so that's why I'm taking the time to do this. The height of the ball above the ground when it hits the ground. We're not talking about bouncing. When it's on the ground, I'll ask it that way. When it's on the ground. How high is the ball above the ground when it's laying on the ground? Zero, right? Zero feet.
So that's our trick. Since this is the height above the ground, after a certain number of seconds, we're going to let this be zero. So zero equals negative 16 T squared plus 96 T plus 640. And that's why I curl my T's because sometimes you've got a curly T right next to a plus sign helps me tell the difference. Anyway, sorry for the phone. It'll stop. Now, you've got a GCF of 16 here. I bet. Let's make sure. Let's make sure that 16 goes into 96. Yes, it does, okay. Um, so 16 is gonna be our GCF because I know it goes into 64. 16 is going to be our GCF, but look at the leading term here. Look at the leading coefficient, it's negative. So our GCF is gonna have to be negative 16, not positive 16. So let's figure this out. Negative 16, times t squared plus negative 16 times 6 times t, or I should say 6t, no reason to put 6 in parentheses alone, plus negative 16 times negative 40 I think, but I'm going to make sure. Negative 16 times negative 40 is positive 640. Okay, good. So I will pull out said negative GCF. No, 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 this is going to be negative 2. Negative 16 times negative 6 is positive 96. Uh, minus 40. There we go. Now, negative 16 is just a number. It does not have a variable with it. So since this is an equation, I can divide it out because it's just in the way. Boom, boom. So zero equals T squared minus 6T minus 40. Now, I refuse to use the calculator on this. I know that 40 equals four times 10. And the 10 minus 4 is 6. So, all right, this is negative 40, really. So I need to make one of these negative. So I'll make the bigger one negative. Because when you add a positive and a negative number, and the bigger number is negative, or bigger absolute value is negative, um, you get a negative answer. That's the important thing here. 4 plus negative 10 equals negative 6. And what I want is negative 6. So since 1 is the number in front of t squared, I don't have to go to, I don't have to use the AC method in grouping. All I have to do is group like this. T and T and plus four and minus 
10. No. You set each factor equal to zero. T plus four equals zero. T minus 10 equals zero. Now T is time. So when I say minus four and minus four, that's going to give me time equals a negative four seconds. Really? Yeah. Not in my classroom, you don't. So plus 10, plus 10. We're going to say, OK, after 10 seconds. The ball hits the ground or the egg, if you were nasty and th and through an egg. Splat, no bouncing there. So, how long? How long also means how much time. How long, how, after how long will the ball reach the ground? Well, 10 seconds, of course. Ten seconds. Okay, want to go looking for more word problems. Yeah, yep, we got a couple of ratio problems. Most people were able to do these on their own. Does anyone want me to go over the ratio problems? OK. Then this is new. I hear somebody hissing. Sounds like sounds like. Um, um, astronauts up in space. Come in Houston. All right, we're being asked to find the domain. This is how you always find the domain of a square root. Take out the radicand, 3x minus 2. Set it greater than or equal to 0. So there's a hint automatically. You're going to have a greater than or equal to in your answer. But plus 2, plus 2. Three X is greater than or equal to two. Divide by three, divide by three. X is greater than or equal to two thirds. So there you go. Okay, now. You can put that in your calculator or you can recognize it's the fourth root of 16. I recommend the calculator. Sixteen. Carrot. Ah, now I left I left my calculator with the old operating system, so this is ideal really. Parentheses, because you're going to put a fraction in there. One divided by four. Parentheses closed. There you've got 16 raised to the one fourth power. Enter. The answer is two. That's true. How about 16 to the three fourths power? Same thing. 16 caret parentheses three divided by four. Parentheses closed. If you've got a little box, you don't need to do that. So if I go to mode and go on down and switch back to the newer operating system. And if I do 16 caret 
automatically it goes to that box. So all I have to do is say three divided by four, and it's up there in the box. Enter. It's eight. That's true. All right, now rewrite with rational exponents. You need to memorize that square roots are always one half powers. This is going to be your radicand 2, which now is the base of the exponent, to the one half power. That's all you're being asked to do. You cannot simplify that. You can try, but you can't. OK, then again, here's this. 22. To the 1 fourth power. Don't say fourth power, it's 1 fourth. All right, we're going to do some transformations, but I'll look for, for word problems. Maybe there aren't any more. Probably you can do the transformations on your own, or maybe you cannot. Um, this number at the end is always the vertical shift, always. And that plus sign means up. The number added or subtracted in here is always the horizontal shift. But the problem is that plus means go to the left. It's very confusing. Anyway, start with the graph of. How do you know what the basic graph is? You've got g of x equals x plus 2 squared plus 5. It'll be this variable and that power. So x squared. And then what's being done to pour x squared? Well, two units, you're going to move it left. Even though that feels very counterintuitive, it is counterintuitive, but it's the way it is. Move it two units to the left and up five units. There you go. And here are the words you choose. I like the ones with drop down boxes better. Maybe if you don't type, maybe if it's not printed, it's a drop down box. There. Ah, this is the one that most people are going to miss. This number is considered separately from the sign. This is the vertical shrink. This is something separate. That negative sign is the reflection across the x-axis.
And that, of course, is the horizontal shift to the left three units, and the basic function is x to the second power. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to review all that stuff. Now, do you feel comfortable now with analyzing rational functions? We spent a good deal of time on it. This question, what's the horizontal asymptote of that? Well, the highest power of the bottom is bigger than the highest power of the top. And when that happens, your uh, horizontal asymptote is automatically the line Y equals zero, which is the X axis. So Y equals zero. Now, we've got just a few minutes. I have a meeting at noon, so I'm going to have to go. Um, what do you want to talk about? How do you feel about these? Have you gone, have you over, gone over it? No, I'll do it. You want me to? Yes, please. OK. Find the solutions. Well, we have to find the um, uh, uh, the uh, least common multiple. OK, um, and so we also have to be aware that there are certain numbers that that this cannot equal. Uh, some people want to wait till the end. Some people want to, you know, just get right in there. I believe in figuring it out at first. So if you said all of the denominators equal to zero and solve, what you're going to find is that there are only two numbers that give you trouble, that have to be taken out of the domain. Or just think of it as numbers that your answer cannot be allowed to equal. So this will give you Z equals 13. This, this will be Z plus 13, Z minus 13 equals zero. Then you set each factor equal to zero. Z plus 13 equals zero. Z minus 13 equals zero. So you're going to get Z equals negative 13 and Z equals positive 13. These are all the numbers that Z cannot be allowed to equal. So you want to write it down somewhere that Z cannot equal 13 and Z cannot equal negative 13. OK, now you need to find we need to go to. That's not what I want. We need to go to the scratch paper for this. Ain't no way to do it in your head. You could do the 13 part in your head. But but I really don't think you could do this in your head. So now that we know Z cannot equal 13 or negative 13, we have to find our GCF. And that is, if you, if you recognize the pattern that's being used here, uh, 
on the homework. Z minus 13. Z squared minus 169. Z plus 13. Um, this factors. We already factored it. This, on the other hand, is just Z minus 13. It doesn't factor. And this is Z plus 13. It doesn't factor. But notice that this is included in this, and this is included in this. So your LCM, your least common multiple or lowest common multiple, is going to be Z plus 13, Z minus 13. And that's going to be used to cancel out all the denominators. So your first step is to write this making sure your denominators are all factored. Well, this is the only, the only one that actually factors. Okay, so that's what we're gonna have. We're going to have Z over Z minus 13 plus Z, and I make these really long fraction bars because I'm going to be writing the LCM up in the numerator. Um, what is this? Z plus 13, Z minus 13 equals Z plus 14 over Z plus 13. Okay, I had to go, I had to be able to see the original. All right, now, my next move is to multiply each term by the LCM. All right, yeah, now we do the thing that I find very entertaining, and that is canceling. And you can like have sound effects. Boom, 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 boom. Something you'll have to give up when you're taking exams back in classrooms. All of my denominators are gone. Yay! So now I write what's left over. I have a Z and a Z plus 13. Here I only have a Z. And over here I have a Z plus 14 times a Z minus 13. And now I don't have any fractions, which makes all of this somewhat easier on me. So I'm going to have Z squared plus 13Z plus 1Z equals 
Okay, we're going to do that little thing. Boom, 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 boom. Which will give me Z squared minus 13C plus 14C. Yuck, minus 13 times 14, doggone it. Negative 13 times 14. It's negative 182. Okay, make sure. 182, yes, okay. So now I'm going to combine these terms and I'm going to combine these terms. I will have Z squared plus 14 Z equals Z squared minus 13 Z plus 14 Z is plus one Z minus 182. And now I have to gather my terms all over to one side and set it equal to zero. Set the equation equal to zero because this is a quadratic equation. But as soon as I subtract my z squared, I see, oh gosh golly, my z squareds are going to cancel out, which means this is not going to be a quadratic function anymore. 14z equals 1z minus 182. So I add, I subtract 1z from both sides. Subtract 1z, subtract 1z, which leaves me a negative 182 on the right and a 13z on the left. And now I see, I just see if that's divisible by 13. I would love it. Oh, <gasps> what do you know? Negative 14. So when I divide by 13 and 13, I'll get Z equals negative 14, which thank goodness is not 13 or negative 13. So there's no reason for me to not use negative 14 as my answer. <laughs>